everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Comic Corner. Today, I am your host, TJ, a.k.a. Fat Thor, and joining me is my wonderful friend, A.F. Parker. And today, we are joined by a very, very special guest. You may know him as the writer of Chew, Batman Eternal, Detective Comics, Suicide Squad Kills Arkham Asylum, and most recently, Absolute Power Task Force 7. Today, we are joined by John Lehman. John, how are you doing, my friend? Thank you so much Pretty for joining good. us. First thing in the morning on a Sunday. I'm uh, I'm, gl- I'm glad I woke up for this. You can thank my cats that were crying for food. Yep, it's an early morning for at least for me and you. AF is ending his day while we are starting our day, but we could not be more excited to have you on here today. We got a lot of great books to talk about and some new books that just got announced. So yeah. we have some really exciting stuff to get to. But before we get to that, we like to do like a lot of other shows do, you know, kind of comic origin, how you got into comics, stuff oh, sure. of that nature. So I saw that you when talking about getting into comics, you said that really Star Wars is what got you into comics in 1977 and then after that you went on to things like rom uh shogun warriors micronauts you mentioned so i'm curious with both star wars and kind of these more sci-fi genre comics that you were early exposed to uh what were some of the things about those comics that really like grabbed you as a young kid and kind of awakened this love for the medium well uh, okay, first of all, we got to establish that I'm very old if I was around in 1977. And, you know, ni- 1977, there's no VCRs, there's no streaming, there's no, you can't press a button and watch whatever you want. So, you know, Star Wars for my generation was just like a, a thunderclap of, of imagination, you know. Uh, uh, and then it left the theaters and all these kids, or, or me at least, were just, we had nothing. Uh and, you know, I, 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 you know, I wanted, I thought I could, I, I could watch Star Wars every day and never get tired of it. You know, it was, you know, 10 year old kid robots and lasers and all that. And uh, I wanted more. And then one day at the corner store, the 7-Eleven, I see this spinner rack and here's more adventures of Star Wars, you know, for 35 cents or 40 cents, whatever it was, then I could get my monthly kick of, you know, more, you know, more, more of this. You know, there's only one movie at the time. Uh, and then I just, I liked science fiction. So I I, I didn't naturally gravitate to uh, super heroics until later. Like I, I kind of had to like, you know, I, I, I'd bought every, I'd bought every, you know, sci-fi and licensed comic there was. And it's like, oh, I want another comic book. What is there? And, you know, I think I started with Avengers. You know, uh, basically sci-fi was my gateway drug. Something from me, real quick, um, with regards to your origin and you growing up with all of these geeky, nerdy things around you. Um, how did you manage to block out certain types of noises? Because I know me as a kid, you like comics, you like geeky things. You tend to get bullied a little bit. Um, so in terms of, of, of things like that, were they sort of bullying ideologies? No, I mean, like- I... I don't want to say I was the bully, but I was, uh, I, I, I was always pretty sharp and I, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I think I survived by being funny and, uh, I got a, I got a kitten crying who wants out. Who's not gonna, we're not gonna let her out. Yeah. I, bullying was never really an issue. Like I was, I was the funny guy and I could, uh, and I could also kind of cartoon. I can remember one time I had a, a bully after me and I like drew him a motorcycle or, you know, drew him like him on a motorcycle. And I'm sure I, I was terrible, but you know, I was, I was in the fourth grade. So uh, I could always deflect it. It was never really an issue. Like, Oh, you want lunch money? Well here, I got a sick picture of a motorcycle for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, that's a good bargain. My man, you, you were bargaining even in the early days. Yeah. And I was, uh, it wasn't just sci-fi. I played I played D and D, and there was a big oh, yeah. group of us. Like, I I never. It, it was never the cliche of uh, nerds getting beat up because uh, there were a fair amount of us. You know, I I, I ran with a big crew of nerds and uh, D and Ders. That's awesome, and that's awesome too that you guys had that kind of 
like community among each other because I feel like a lot of people unfortunately don't have that. And I mean, I'm a huge fantasy nerd as well, so you like D and D. You're speaking my language, my friend. But after your kind of initial exposure to comics, you said that you also you always wanted to work in comics, and to achieve that, you actually found yourself moving to San Diego with a girl. But really, Comic Con was what was on your mind. And yeah. Oh, you you have studied, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so you got you got to San Diego, and you know, you're kind of working on the fringes, and you got a job as you describe as real life Jimmy Olsen at, over at uh, let's see, San Diego Union Tribune, and you started your Geek Beat, which I when I heard you talk about this, I absolutely love this because this is basically what I do now. But you started just kind of writing about things that you love so you start yeah. writing about spawn tv show <clears throat> excuse me uh the stallone um judge dread movie and would kind of review and you know uh write uh articles about this stuff and that kind of really got you into you know the process of writing and actually taking steps into the comic medium so i wanted to ask you during those during that period when you were kind of just writing articles, you know, working on the fringes of comics, what were some of those things that you learned both professionally and about yourself that you still take with you today in your comic career? Well, oh boy, that's a tough question. I, I, I don't know, except I, I, you know, I, I started making connections. That's where, you know, that's where Jim Lee's studio was. And it was a big time for comics. I mean, that was, Jim Lee's X-Men came out, you know, Death of Superman, Amalgam Universe. Um, uh, that might have been a few years later than X-Men Teen Titans. But I mean, oh, shit. I mean, we're talking like two years removed from Watchmen and and uh, and Dark Knight Returns. You know, <clears throat> granted, that happened in my college and this was post-college. But you were you were just feeling the effects of these things. So it was a it was a. I don't know how much I learned from the newspaper, but it was a fantastic time to be in comics. And, uh, and it was, you know, speaking of nerds being on the, the, the out culture, it was just when I guess the media was starting to realize, Hey, there there's more of them than we think, you know? So it, it got real easy for me to cover. Oh, it's Stallone judge dread movie. I can write about this. It's a comic book. So, um, it was almost this like, interpreter for the normies you know i would come in and say hey you know here's a peek into our world and they were really excited because the you know the newspaper is always looking for content um but what did i learn that i take with me i i'm i'm not real sure it was just um it was just a burgeoning time for the culture like you know it's almost the time when uh nerd culture kind of like you know woke up knocked on the door and said hey everybody we're here how like from somebody who's seen the initial parts of this in, in extraordinary universe, um, as, as I'd like to think of it, compared to how it is now. I mean, we have Agents of Fandom that's covering geek culture, pop culture, and there's so many comicbook.com. Um, compared to the initial stages, what's your how how are you thinking about that extreme boom that's happened over the past 25 years? Well, I mean, what it is now doesn't even compare it to what it what it was. Like when I when I got a comic book column in the book section. 1996 i was uh i was one of the first people in the country if not the first person in the country to have a comic book column in a major you know metropolitan newspaper and now you know you, you no offense you can't throw a rock and hit a podcast or a you know uh you know media and you know when san diego rolls around um you know everyone covers it it's on the cbs news yeah. it's on cnn like uh it, it's uh it's so much bigger and more accepted. Like even with, if I ran with a crew in, in high school, we were still, we were still the minority and I'm pretty much sure nine people out of 10 has seen several Marvel movies, you know, like geek culture is mainstream now. And I think that even goes back to kind of what AF was talking about earlier with like, you know, nerd stuff, being a geek used to be kind of like, you know, uh, niche like it was like a niche right yeah. and like you know you had your friends that were into it but other than that that's really all you had but now you know your grandma could tell you who Thanos is which is yeah. like absolutely yeah. insane so yeah. it's and like you can go to Hot Topic and get you know a Deadpool shirt or a Doctor Strange shirt and the, yeah you know the, these were 
even Iron Man, man, he was a he was a C list character. He was thank you, you know, John. He was a nobody. Thank you. I say that all the time. And the fact that you know we've got you know we've got Deadpool movies. We have three Ant Man movies. I mean, it's 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 just bonkers, dude. It's crazy. Again, the fact that we have three Ant Man movies. Like you tell you told five six year old TJ that he would have slapped you in the face. Yeah. Like <laughs> there's no way. The flip side of this, you. You tell you tell ten year old me that I I've got like, you know, a new Star Wars show to watch every week. I'd be I'd be over the moon. But now it's like they've put out so much of it, I can take it or leave it. It's like, well, mm-hmm. I'll watch this show. I won't watch watch that show. That applies to DC. That applies to Marvel. That applies to Star Trek. Um, I think there's an ar- an argument that there's a little too much of a good thing right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I would I would like thing when something comes out it's such an event that i have to see it and and all these corporations you know in the hunt for you know the dollar have put so much out there that that it's not must see anymore a hundred percent i mean even at my age you know i can remember when phantom menace came out and it was like such a big deal because it's like we thought we were never going to get star wars again yeah. and like same yeah. thing with i even remember you know force awakens was kind of similar to that as well it was like oh my god we're getting more like we yeah. thought this was over but yeah. now yeah. it's <laughs> like it will never end <laughs> yeah and now i turn on disney channel and there's shit i've never heard of it's like <laughs> wait there's a star wars show that like some kind of what if cartoon show like where did this come from like yeah, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say there's too much because it it appeals to someone somewhere. Mm-hmm. But you know, you can yeah. sort of pick pick what your Star Wars thing is now, or pick what your Marvel or DC or or Star Trek. You know, I don't mm-hmm. I don't like Discovery, but I sure love Lower Decks and uh, Strange <laughs> New Worlds. And the fact that you can you know decide which one's for you. Yeah, I, w- I was just about to say the exact same thing. Um, there's there's so many different takes on these glorious bits of IP that say, for example, TJ um, doesn't like something, you don't like something, but I absolutely love it. At least I know that myself and probably a, a minority or maybe not a minority, maybe a majority, maybe you guys are the minority that doesn't love it. Um, but yeah, like there's always something well, that somebody's going to like. And you, you talk about Disney channel, even if it's a minority, it's still 3 million people. Exactly. I think that's just a great, perspective to have on it though because i think and unfortunately we know a lot of people out there that are just like very negative about like oh well i don't like this so i don't like all of this right and i think again it's very refreshing and a good outlook to have of like oh well maybe this wasn't for me but this was and you know this was too and you know this might be for someone else even though it's not for me and like you said it while there is kind of an oversaturation of choice at least the choice is there and i think that's a good thing also i don't like i don't like discovery but i'm not sitting there wishing it didn't exist you know or like holding signs out front like (laughs) cancel discovery i've got my star trek if someone else has theirs you know good for them who you know who does it hurt yeah i love like i said i love that perspective so much especially in this you know nerd and geek boom that we are living in right now in all aspects i mean star wars star trek marvel dc everything is just exploding huge and speaking of that so you one of your most recent projects that you worked on that me and af absolutely loved was uh suicide squad takes arkham asylum and that kind of hits multiple different niches of the uh, kind of things that we're talking about both video games movies and comics so yep. i'm curious with something like the suicide squad that kind of burst into popularity with the movie does that change your approach to writing a book like suicide squad takes on Gar- uh, arkham asylum with like i said the movie and the game as well like adding to that lore or it, do you approach that the same way as you would something same that's way. not quote movie aligned no for me for me you know it's a story is a story and a gig's a gig. And Mm -hmm. I, I have a bucket list that, that it it gets thinner all the time, you know, thank goodness. But I have, you know, these are characters I haven't written. And at the top of my list at the time was Harley. And when they offered me this, it's like, wow, I get the chance to write Harley and uh, you know, scratch her off my, my character bucket list. So that, that's sort of the way, you know, I approached it. Uh, 
and then you know i like video games i like the the uh the batman games so it's like wow i get to contribute to that universe as well so it 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 ticked a bunch of boxes and it paid and it would be fun and i get to work with friends i mean there was the, the only downside is i wrote that thing like two and a half years ago and the game kept getting delayed and we were real proud of the comic and then the game came out and and um it 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 underperformed and what i hated were were a couple of reviewers who are like oh you know the game's no good this comic didn't need to exist and it's like well technically no comic needs to exist you know this was you know you don't you don't like it don't buy it and you know that yeah. just because you didn't like the game doesn't make it a bad story uh and you know that just nothing makes me matter than a, than a reviewer saying this doesn't need to exist. I mean, it's art, you know, art exists for art's sake. Um, you don't like it. Don't be a reviewer. That, that's, that's not a, that's not a valid criticism. And also just the fact that the, the comic is actually a prequel to the video game. So in essence, the comic should be the one that exists. And then, <laughs> well, like, it was, I mean, it was a challenge because I took the gig. Uh, I guess I could spoil this now because it, it came out. And they're like, okay, you know, you're doing a team book, but they don't meet until the beginning of uh, of the game. So you got to do this thing where the characters don't actually meet, which was a real challenge. Uh, and they wanted a, come here, Panda. They wanted a um, a, a a setup issue, then then uh, a, a solo, like a you know you look at each character solo and then they wanted a wrap up and I looked at it and it's like, if they can't meet in, in, in issue six, you don't need a wrap up. And so I actually lobbied for one, one less issue, which I don't know that that happens a lot in the freelance world, but I came back and I'm like, I, I can't do this story, story in six. It needs to be five. And, yeah. um, and they agreed another, another really fun story. Cause, um, you know, this was in, in Arkham continuity and, um, they came to me and I'm like, look, we do this setup issue. It's Arkham. We got to have Batman. Uh, and then, you know, we, we set up the riot and then we focus on each each character's adventure, bringing them together at the very end. And they're like, OK, that's great. But you can't use Batman for for this or that reason. <clears throat> you know, use Robin. And I'm like, that does not have the same effect. You know, you know, Nightwing, Robin, they're all cool, but they're not yeah. freaking Batman and they're not Arkham Asylum. So I. I Kobayashi marooned it, and I'm like, I'm going to write my story that I want, and I know you've told me I can't. I want you to read it to know that I can pull it off, and if you don't like it, I rip it up, and I rewrite it your way, but I have to show you it can be done. And I did it. They, I guess they didn't quite understand flashbacks and non-linear, because they're like, Batman's at this point, you know, right here. And it's like, well, he wasn't three months ago. We just opened in a flashback. So I did it, and they're like, wow, this is great. This works. We get to use Bat. You use Batman. It makes the story better. We trust you. And, you know, licensors can be a pain in the ass because they always want things their way and you got to give it to them. And uh, gaining their trust right out of the, the bat was was great because they kind of like let me do whatever I want after that. Uh, that became a really good relationship. Yeah, that, that must have felt pretty sweet. Yeah, it, <laughs> just, it, it always feels good to say I was right. You're wrong. <laughs> Um, just, just, uh, to build up, build on, on that answer that, uh, that you just gave now. So the, the game story was set and solidified and you were busy with these like prequel sort of stories to, to get to the, the beginning of the game. Was there anything you mentioned Batman? Um, they, they told you Batman was a no go. Were there any other elements or any other superheroes or any other sort of story ties that were off limits for you? Not off limits there was actually the other thing where they wanted me to hit certain notes you know there's a there's a flashback in issue two where deathstroke is 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 um uh shot at by like a, a mystery person we had to make it make it look like we had to make it look like um somebody else and uh but we had to keep the identity secret because that gets revealed in the game so that like they kind of gave me a list of you know minor notes hey you got to hit these which isn't that different from absolute power you know absolute power i did a one shot stuck in the middle of things and like you know here's the story here's the story your story is in the middle 
you have to, you know, seamlessly kind of bridge the gaps. So it wasn't so much of a what you can't do. It's what you, you know, here's what you need to do. Nice. Cats all over me. <laughs> and that's super interesting, too, how you talk about, you know, telling the story in the way that you think the story should be told. And yeah. like you said, you know, they gave you six issues, but you had the kind of know with all and the experience to know like, Oh, the story that I want to tell, I can do it better in five. And I think that that's just super interesting and something that only an experienced writer would be. Yeah, able to do. I, th I think a younger writer would be, uh, I, I guess a little more compliant, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a newer writer, uh, and it's not that I'm not eager eager to please, but I know, I I know what I, what what would make the best story if I'm writing it, and and I'm not I'm not afraid to tell them I can make it better if we do it this way, uh, and and you know it it's not like you're pushing back, it's not like you're fighting them because you know if they insisted on six, I would have done six, I would have found a way to make it work, uh, but uh, you know, kind of good communication, knowing what the story can be, and uh, you know knowing your limits. Yeah. And I mean, that's what comics is all about is collaboration and especially, you know, trusting your collaborators is a huge part of that. And so to get that kind of trust from the editors for that, I think, like AF said, was probably a fantastic feeling. Well, and that was the other thing. It was uh, it was an editor who I'd worked with. I mean, they, they brought me in because she trusted me. And so I was able to tell her Katie Kubert, one of my absolute favorites. I was able to tell her, you know, hey this is what's going to get us, you know, the best story. And of course she is an editor. Her job is to make the licensor happy. So, you know, um, you know, her, her job is basically deliver a story that gets approved. And, uh, and, but she also knows that Batman sells comics. Like if you can get Batman in the first issue in, in an Arkham riot, that's what you want to do. Not freaking Robin. No offense against Robin, but you guys know what I'm saying. Say Damon is is off somewhere <laughs> fuming right now, but <laughs> I think Damon, that's yeah. yeah I, I was just going to point out to to John that um, Damon is uh, one of the the, the co-hosts on the show, but he unfortunately couldn't make today. But he is probably Dick Grayson's biggest fan. So well, yeah, if he's going you know, to, to I get watch to write Dick now with Titan, so you know it's all good. I say, yeah, Damon will be happy later on in this interview for sure. Yeah. But again, just like the kind of foresight to being like telling not you know the like the story, but the best story. And I think again, that's just such an interesting thing to talk about. And something else I wanted to ask you before we move on to Absolute Power, one last thing on Arkham is so you obviously have a lot of experience writing Batman. You wrote Detective Comics, you did Batman Eternal, you even did, I think it was like Batman 900 or something, like some special, yeah, you know, crazy yeah, I, edition. I, I hit two specials. One was the anniversary of uh, Batman 27, mm -hmm. uh, which was like a 50 page issue, and then Batman 900, which one of the two of them was like a 50 page issue, which I wrote most of. Like, now I look back, I was writing Chew, I was writing Mars Attacks, I was writing all these Batman books. It's like, how the hell did I do that? You were busy and booked, my friend. But yeah. with that, all that bat experience flowing through your veins, I'm curious, what was it like stepping into the shoes of the uh, antagonist for Suicide Squad and like stepping in the shoes of his rogues gallery as opposed to the bat himself? Was that a, a different at all or was it very similar since you're still playing in that same world? I think villains are always more fun. And stories are kind of defined by the villain because, you know, Batman's always right. He's always one step ahead. It's not necessarily fun to write someone who's always right or always, you know, perfect. And, uh, you know, getting, you know, getting, getting the flawed characters are a little more fun. Oh, another fun story about Arkham is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's set in a different continuity and they have killed people. And, uh, so I'm like, hey man, you you know you killed this character in the game. You're killing you're killing these characters in the upcoming game. You know I've got Arkham. Can I kill characters? And they're like, oh sure. You know just give us a list of who you want. And I gave them like a list of thirty, thinking I'd get like one or two. And they came back and they're like, well, you can't kill these one or two. It's like, oh, that's great. Um, 
So, I mean, that was, that was real fun knowing you're not part of continuity and you can like, you know, screw around and give Mad Hatter a, a grisly death and stuff like that. Like who gets to do that? Very true. That is a fantastic opportunity to find yourself in. Cause like you said, it's like you have not only do you, ha can you kill off a character, but you have almost a pick of them. So I'm yeah. sure that gives you even more just like feeling of creative freedom when again, working on something that is so in the lines of like, again, like movie franchise, uh, gaming franchise. Like I'm sure that the Harley that you wrote was, you know, they wanted it to be similar to Margot Robbie. You know what I mean? Like I'm sure they, there was yeah. certain parameters that and you had it was to rated hit. R. I got, you know, I got to, you know, I, I don't think I got to throw F bombs in, but I got, you know, I got Harley saying shit and, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was fun. And I like, um, uh, you know, I, I got to scratch her off my list and the Harley, Harley issue is by far my favorite. And one of my, uh, like, I think that issue is super funny. Like I went to the editor and I'm like, dude, I write a good Harley Quinn. Give me more. And then of course the editor quit and moved on. Well, shouts out Katie for giving you that opportunity in the first place, because it's absolutely wonderful. And everyone, out, everyone listening, and watching this, make sure to go out and go pick up a copy of suicide squad, take on Arkham Asylum. Well, I, think but the, that I think the trade will be right around the corner. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. perfect. Perfect timing. Look, the stars are aligning here on Comic Corner. But all of that experience in Batman, DC, D, uh, Batman villains, all that has all led into this new absolute power and also the new all-in initiative that is coming from DC that was just announced this uh, couple last weeks ago. And so with that, you are now writing Task Force 7 for the Absolute Power tie-in event. And something that I really wanted to ask you about, and you mentioned very briefly, was so you've talked about how you like to plan out your stories like pretty meticulously. And for example, something like Chew that was like 60 issues long, you got like a real long run runway for that so with this absolute power obviously it's a tie-in kind of a mini uh what is like some of the challenges that you find in uh how do i say like playing in someone else's sandbox as opposed to having something that you know has a real long runway well this was really tough because the the beginning was given to me the end was given to me and they told me a lot of the things that that, that had to happen and I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was like handcuffed, but you know, maybe, maybe I was on a leash and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you, you have to, it, it's part of, I'm writing a chapter in the middle of a story. So there was a lot of coordination and, you know, you, you, you know that going in, so you can't go in and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to play God. I'm going to redefine Aquaman. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do an Alan Moore anatomy lesson and completely like just rock his world because you're not. You know, you're you're getting him from point A to point B. Uh, you get to have I get to knock Doom Patrol off my bucket list. That was that was my main reason for taking it. Um, I get paid. I work with a new editor and I work with Mark Wade, who's a buddy. So, you, you know, you kind of factor all the things in and like the story wasn't the most satisfying thing because it wasn't completely mine, because, again, I'm writing a chapter in a book, but I get to be part of something cool. I get to be paid and all the, all the other good things, you know, I said about it. So it's, um, it's a smaller achievement. If, 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 if you get my meaning, you know, a couple, couple weeks worth of work and I get something cool and I get to be part of something and I'll have a nice, you know, collection on my bookshelf with my name on it. Yeah. I, I was about to ask like, what drew you to this absolute power event? But I mean, like if, if Doom Patrol is some some of the characters that you've been wanting to draw or wanted to wanted to write for for a very long time, then I guess that must have been a really sweet feeling to be able to just pen some of these amazing characters. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, I didn't get to tro tell my Doom Patrol story. You know, I got to use Doom Patrol, so there was a little bit of a difference. But at this point in my career, you know, like I said, I've got a list and. You know, as long as I get to write a character for a panel or two, they're off the list. And uh, and so if I have an opportunity to hit a bucket list character, you know, I'm gonna. Yeah. So just in terms I'm of. I'm going to grab more coffee. We can keep, keep rolling. As... 
Um, yeah, just in terms of like the storyline. So if you haven't read Task Force 7 yet, there is a couple of spoilers that I might be bringing up right now. But in issue two, so each issue is a different creative team, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and you, you, you are at the helm or like you end up writing issue two. And yeah, there's a lot of Atlantis within that issue. Uh, was that something that you've always wanted to do? Was uh, right for the Atlantean people, right? No, a sort of Atlantis centric story. It wasn't like my dream, but I had never done it. And uh, and then they're like, Oh, you get to use Atlantis, you get to use Aquaman. It's like, All right, that's cool, you know, get to say, you know, get to say I did that. But yeah, it wasn't like something I'd been waiting my whole career to do, you know what I mean. Cool. It's a good thing to add to that list of repertoire of characters. And I love, too, how you took, because I never really thought of it like this, but it's a perfect way to describe it, how you say, you know, you're writing a chapter in the book. Not You're not writing the whole book, just a chapter of it. And I think that's super interesting. And I'm sure that creates, like you were talking about, kind of its own challenges of, you know, making sure the story fits within the, again, the parameter similar to what we were just talking about with Arkham. But in this, it's this big kind of tapestry of storytelling going across the whole medium. Well, it, and, you know, it's something different. And that that's part of it is I like... Um... You know, I like taking gigs that are different, and I like uh, kind of challenging myself. I mean, like, Test Force 7 was definitely a challenge because you had to, you know, you had to fit it in. You know, you're, you're, you basically, you're, you're carving a puzzle piece to fit in a puzzle. Yeah, and you're basically responsible for so many of these superheroes now <laughs> having their powers yeah. zapped away. Yeah, I mean, that, that was fun, too. Yeah. I'm killing the um, coffee, guys. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, the so yeah, just going back to absolute power, um, the the standard or the the main issue. So that started off with a bit of a blast, and uh, you wrote the the second issue of Task Force Seven. But in the main issues, we see that Oliver Queen sort of becomes this uh, part of the, of the Task Force team. Uh, he's switched over to Amanda Waller's side. And just in terms of which characters you thought or you knew were coming your way in the Task Force 7 issues, um, like what was that sort of process of you finding out which characters were allowed, which characters weren't allowed? Well, and they, they straight out told me from the beginning, hey, this is an Aquaman story with Tempest and Doom Patrol. You know, this is, you know, this is the gig you're getting. Do you want it? Okay. And then the irony to that is I'm now writing uh, Arsenal in uh, in uh, Teen Titans. So I'm, uh, um, without knowing it, I took this gig and now I'm, uh, you know, dealing with the repercussions. Now you got to deal with the consequences of your own actions. And that's a yep. perfect, absolute perfect segue into our next topic, which is Titans. So you are going to be taking over Titans from Tom Taylor. And I, so I'm not as knowledgeable on DC as AF and Damon are, but so is this going to be in the all in yes, aspect uh, of the universe or is this yeah, the it, main? It, it, it's Titans? basically standard. Un all the all in universe is the standard universe as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, absolute, which is kind of like, um, I don't know. I, I'm sure DC wouldn't like me to say this, but you know, it's kind of like an Ultimates. Ultimate universe. You know, it's yeah. a it's a pocket, you know, new universe. Uh, but I'm uh, you know, I'm I'm in the classic DCU. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure I had that right before I go down this line of questioning. But uh, actually, Titans was one of the titles that you mentioned as one of the, you know, your early exposures to comics. The, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up with my words. The Wolfman and Perez uh, Teen Titans run. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like having that kind of love for these characters, what was it like? getting the call that you're going to be taking up this title and as well taking it over from Tom Taylor, who, I mean, this, the Titans run that he's been doing has been absolutely awesome. So oh yeah, Tom, again, Tom, Tom is a, he's a saint. I don't know if enough people say this, like he's just a genuinely good dude. He's always cheerful. He's always nice. He's very welcoming. Like you, you plus all his stories are solid. 
like uh tom's gotten some like there's some weird fans out there and he's gotten some hate for like nightwing or tightwing titans or whatever and and i don't get the fans who are that freaking obsessed or get that angry because comics always kind of revert like oh you're mad at how nightwing is don't worry you know it'll go back to normal you know someone else will do a take you like in a couple of years so you know or a few months get over it but um uh tom is just a freaking great dude and so like to follow him up on uh you know shit i grew up with i mean titans titans were one of my big ones as a kid it was you know burn claremont x-men and titans you know i was like i said i was reading comics at a really good my formative years were really good comic book years and and uh and also like i'm writing spawn now too which i i you know, is a different conversation, but the fact that here I am writing Spawn stuff and Teen Titans, uh, it's pretty crazy to think about. Yeah, so like, if you can just run us through the process of how this entire Titans oh sure uh, well, so, deal came about. Well, again, I think I owe, I think I owe everything to Katie Kubert because she's been throwing work at me on an irregular basis for. Um, for the last couple of years and I get into the DC mixer and I meet editors at, at San Diego and one editor called me about, you know, Hey, do you want to do this task force thing? You know, it's only one issue. You know, you get paid, you get to you know, all the good things that come out of that. And I wrote it and I'm writing the spawn team book. And I think they really liked the, the, the team dynamics I did, you know, cause, cause I only had 22 pages to tell exactly the story they wanted me to, but also balance characters, try to give everyone their moment. And they're like, we kind of like your team dynamics. Do, do you want to try the Titans? And I'm like, the teen Titans? You mean like, you know, Nightwing and Starfire and all that? They're like, yeah. And I'm thinking there's a thing called a bake-off that um, when, when editors call, when they're doing a new book, they might call like six writers and then ask for six different pitches and they, they pick the best one. And I'm like, this is a bake off, right? How many am I up against? And they're like, no, no, it's 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 all yours if you want it. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, what what do I have to do? And they're like, well, just say you want it and start working on it. And uh, it didn't seem real, uh, but I I think I think DC is juggling so much right now, and uh, like this all in, like it, it's almost I don't want to say it's a reset button, but they're doing so much to the universe that it it feels new you know it's a good jumping on point for everybody so i think they wanted to bring in some new blood and some new i'm not exactly a fresh voice but um i'm a different voice because i haven't done anything ongoing in dc for 10 years they basically called me and so like i threw a bunch of i like I, I i went at it with from a very character perspective like here's each character here's their dilemma here's what they're going through and you know hey we like this we don't like this you can't do this, you know, for continuity reasons, you can do this, you know, they basically checked, you know, Hey, pursue this, pursue that. And they, they kind of steered me. They're like, Hey, wouldn't it be great if we did this? And I'm like, Oh, you want me to do this? <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I think I also showed that I'm, I'm good with working with editors. I mean, part of that comes from being an editor at Wildstorm. Like I understand these guys are juggling you know, eight books and they got to keep the continuity. Like, like the, the, the writers who come in and they say, I've got my story and it can't deviate. It's got to be my way. They're not going to last because, uh, I always said that, that chew was a symphony, like it's mine. And I could make every note precise where Batman's like jazz. I'm writing one issue. And then they tell me, Oh, you know, Grant Morrison's killing Robin. You gotta, you know, you gotta deal with that. And, uh, you can't have too rigid a long-term plan because it will get changed, you know, just by the nature of you are a, you're a piece of machinery in a larger machine. And, and, you know, you're, you, I don't want to say you're a cog that makes you sound, you, you're a gear and you gotta, you know, you gotta keep moving to keep the machine going. You gotta, you know, it's a, it's symbiotic. Everyone's got to work together. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love hearing about like, you know, 
like obviously we always think like your own story right like teen titans right like what happens in that run affects what will happen later but then also thinking about like what everybody else is doing in the universe like oh oh man jackson and colin just you know killed off superman and outsiders so now we got to deal with the right right? like it's like you have to kind of like you said jazz like kind of adapt and dance with everyone else that's working in dc as well and i think that just one is just so cool and interesting to think about how that process works and also kind of contributes to what you're saying with this whole you know dc's new all-in initiative like you know kind of shaking things up letting creators tell these you know we not weirder but you know like differing stories i think yeah it, it, you know it's a it's a new status quo and you got to you gotta you gotta put a pr- fresh coat of paint on things to you know every once in a while just to you know get the new readers or you know get somebody's attention. Oh, you know you you've, you've drifted off from Titans. You know, come check us out now. It's a you know it's it's a, the the things you like are the same, and then there's a lot of things that are going to be different. So so you 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 are writing this this Titans run, and we know that we've been reading up until this point or up until this absolute power event started it was called the dawn of dc that was basically the i don't know if it was a soft sort of reboot uh for for the comic runs um but will all in signal the end of the dawn of dc so is the dawn of dc no more um i don't know if that's something you are allowed to speak about or yeah i I guess continuing the metaphor i'd say dawn's broke and maybe you know the sun's out now you know, it's uh, it it it's I a like new that. day kind of thing. You know, uh, the, the, the dawn was the event leading to everything that that's going to follow. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, we've mentioned this so many times on this show, and myself and Damon both really just enjoy the fact that the dawn of DC is this large umbrella, and everything is just connected in Batman, Superman, The Flash, Green yeah. Arrow, Green Lantern. All of these stories are connected. They all show up in each other's um, uh, comic runs, and the stories are so tightly connected that yeah, DC you, has a, you... a long term plan. And they even, you yeah. know, when I, when I met with the editors, they're like, "Sort of, here's a PowerPoint of what we're leading to, and here's you know the Titans' role in things." And it's like, "Yeah, this is you know this this is cool. I haven't done something like this in a while, and uh, you know, I'm game." I, I absolutely love it. I've been loving all of the runs that I've been lead, uh, reading up until this point. Um, I I absolutely love Jeremy Adams' uh, Flash run. That's over there behind me. Um, so good. He moved on to, to Green Lantern, and then Cy Spurrier took over um, on, on The Flash. So I don't know if Cy is going to keep on writing The Flash in all in the all-in universe, but is there anything I feel that like anybody is, would admit? I, I'm not positive. I'm sorry, okay. what was your question? No, I was just asking, is there anybody that you've met that you needed to ensure that you're on the right path with what you're going to be doing in Titans? Um, well, I, I've got a lot of communication with Mark Wade, who's doing uh, Justice League, you know, okay. because Justice League is sort of the tent pole, and, uh, you know, they're back, uh, you know, after... Oh shit! Am I supposed to say that? I think it's obvious. I think they've solicited a new justice. I think, League, so. yeah, I think they announced yeah. that already. Yeah. I... Um, but you know, they're 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 the flagship, and you know, everything, everything that happens, you know, sort of happens under um, Justice League. And uh, you know, since the Titans kind of were the de facto Justice League for a while, they, you know, they, they they were the young kids who had to step up. You know, they've they've this was the role they've always been training for. They were the, the sidekicks. And if anything happens to the main team, they take over. That's what happens. What happens yeah. when the main team comes back? You know, the Titans had a little bit of a spotty record, you know, beast wars happened like a lot of, a lot of shit went down and arguably did Titans do the best job they could have, uh, or, or are they inferior to justice league? I mean, these, these are the things they're dealing with mentally. And, I will tell you this. Tom Taylor's run was really great. It it reintroduced the team. It you know it it showed everyone who Titans are. Titans got along too well. Everyone was too happy. Uh, that that was my main thing. I was like coming in. It's like this this team is too functional, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shake that shit up. 
I yeah. love that so much. And that honestly leads perfectly into the next question I wanted to ask you, which before shout out Tom Taylor and Nicholas Scott, like that run is absolutely great. Go check it out. But like, oh, you I got to say said, Nicholas art is just whew, insane, oh. right? Like you know, I, I've oh watched her develop. She was talented. Uh, you know, I'm so old. I can remember when people started <laughs> and uh, like, you know, she, she was a good promising newcomer years ago and you know i maybe i hadn't seen her work in 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 a while because i don't i don't obsessively follow superhero comics um but holy shit i mean it it was just beyond gorgeous and now i got pete woods who's also fantastic yeah nicola's art is absolutely um, like amazing i'm not even reading titans like week by week but her art is just so dang good it's hard not to you know keep up with that but yeah. with this new run, you just mentioned it perfectly, something that I, I'm not going to say dislike because that's not the right word. But the relationship between the team was something that you kind of wanted to touch on with your run. And yeah. that's what I wanted to ask you going from something like, you know, the Suicide Squad and these other kind of teams what was your approach to dealing with this iconic team of the Teen Titans and the relationship between all these characters? Because obviously after, like you just said, Beast War, Beast War and, you know, Garo and all this stuff, like Titans have been through a lot of crap recently. So yeah. what was your approach to this team dynamic? Well, basically to kind of make them unhappy, like, um, uh, I think this is public because it's on the cover, but we're adding Arsenal to the to the the roster, and he's a bit of like the the way I'm I'm looking at it is is um like Titans after all this time they're they're kind of like a a finely honed team like they've got like this good balance, and then you get this guy who's a little bit of a loud mouth, a little bit cocky, a little bit rebellious. He comes in, and they're already kind of in a bad place mentally because different bad things have happened to them all. And he kind of, you know, he rocks the boat. And so, you know, my whole thing was I got to come in and make the team a little less functional because when I read Titans, you know, they were a lot less mature. So you've got like, you know, they're, they're mad at changeling because he's leaving his, you know, plates, you know, all over and their slobs and, you know, different kind of funny things, but like the, the, the bickering kind of made them more real. The fact that they, didn't get along so i wanted to bring it back and you can't you can't make them immature again i mean these guys are the titans not the team titans but i did want to add uh an element of instability uh just for better for better soap opera for for better drama you know they're not all going to get along i'm extremely excited for for this new run for the all in universe to start for the absolute universe to start so i will be First in line to buy your 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 your, your Titans run. Um, I can't wait. Uh, but well, I just, just turned in my second issue. I turn in really detailed. They they want a beat sheet where you tell them what's happening, and I basically turn in a pretty elaborate plot. You know, here's what happens in every panel. Uh, so Monday I'll get notes. But yeah, I'm uh, I, I've, I've I've jumped into it. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um. You mentioned earlier about your time as an editor in Wildstorm. And during that time, you were an editor for the Authority. And that was in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, or you, I think you were an editor for about 14 issues. So it's a good chunk of that, of that run. And it was the basis of uh, these characters that they were built in, in that run. So with those characters entering the DCU under James Gunn's very watchful eye. Uh, what are your hopes uh, to to see these characters on the silver screen? Well, you know, um, Authority at the time was kind of a it was a lightning bolt. You know, you hadn't seen anything like it, and it was it was you know kind of the widescreen Michael Bay action, which you know we. we the ultimates wouldn't have existed without it. And, and I think a lot of the Marvel universe movies wouldn't have like, like what made authority. So um, kind of groundbreaking is now part of the mainstream. And you'd, you'd have these, you know, these giant, this giant like action spectacle. And then you'd have the engineer, you know, smiling and saying, you know, I love this job. 
and uh you didn't you didn't have that at the time you're also coming out of kind of like everything was grim grim and gritty and it you know it it had its edge but it was also uh it was just different than anyone had ever seen and i don't know i don't know how they're going to make that new you know that they can recapture it but we've seen it now but that being said i do trust james gunn like uh you know he make he he makes good movies and he's true to the characters so can't wait to see what he does oh uh, nice I, I i'm actually with you i think um dc films and and tv projects have been pretty much hit, hit or miss for the past Ooh. 10 to to 15 years that's uh, an understatement so, um, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be nice. I said, so, I'm going to keep quiet on this one. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the fact that we have somebody that, that knows the source material very well. And, I mean, just he's um, the, the way that he, he showed the, the showed up the new logo for DC Studios. The fact that it's the throwback DC comic logo. That oh, the bullet? Oh, Studios. I don't know anyone who wasn't happy about that. You know, that everyone says... That's the best logo, and uh, that, like, shit, I'm gonna have I my wasn't, with the DC bullet. Yeah, if 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 I wasn't believing in James Gunn already, that just like put the cherry on top for me because he gets these characters, he knows these characters, and I'm just I'm full of so much hope um, for all the movies and TV projects that we are going to be getting. Um, are there any projects that you would like to still do? And I know that you mentioned earlier. Your uh, your desirables have, have become a bit thin, but Marvel, DC, Image, are there any characters still on the table you would love to still? Well, I'll, I'll tell you my, my bucket list as it stands. Uh, I'd like to write the Archies. I'd like to write Star Wars, uh, Star Trek Lower Decks, uh, Firestorm, Etrigan. Uh, I've, I, I don't really... I don't really want to write Superman like as a as a series, but now that I'm touching Titans, I want to I want to get a Superman scene in there so I can say I've written. I mean, what's more iconic than saying you've written Superman and Batman? So you know, I I do plan on using Superman at least once. Uh, but the, like with Marvel, I don't have any bucket list characters. Between, I've done a lot of crossovers like House of M, FF, long time ago. And uh, Army of Darkness versus uh, Marvel Zombies and my Gambit run, I was able to. I don't have any Marvel characters that I haven't touched that I'm dying to touch. Where there's still a few DC characters that uh, you know that I haven't. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just uh, you know take opportunities and look at the characters and look at you know who do I get to work with. The the other factor is who's my artist. You know, do, like you know you want to work with great people, and it's like. Someone's like, oh, you know, this book's with Pete Woods. Yeah, fuck yeah, I'll work with Pete, Pete Woods. Yeah, uh, I've gotten really lucky. Um, it, it's over 25 years. I think I've disliked maybe two artists, maybe three. Uh, and I tend to get along with everybody. Um, also, as an editor, you know, I, I know what editors have go through. Um, so... Uh, like I don't come back and with a lot of like petty changes. Like I, I look at an art. Okay, this guy didn't draw exactly what I asked, but I ask myself: Is there a single reader whose enjoyment of the book is going to be diminished by the the artist drawing this instead of drawing that? And if the answer is no, if it's just about me, you let that go. You don't need a correction. You 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 make a correction when uh, when it affects the story to the detriment, but. You, you put something out and what's in the artist's head and what goes on the page may be different than what's in your head. doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it different. And that's what, um, that's what collaboration is all about. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching here. I'm going off on a tangent. No, please yeah, no. don't. We, we talk about all the time on this show again, like just the power of collaboration and, you know, everybody working towards a common goal of, you know, presenting the best idea for the story. And I just love hearing people talk about that because really that's what comics are built on. And I also love 
to how you talk about, you know, at this point in your career, you've written so many different characters, so many, you know, different franchises. It's really about the people you're working with that excites you as opposed to like, oh, you're getting to write this character or this person. And again, just like to the power of collaboration, like what yeah. comics is built off. I just, I love hearing about that. Well, and there's also, there's a lot of metrics. There's, mm -hmm. there's the character, there's the story, there's the, there, the creatives. There's also the editor. There's also the company. Like, uh, in my opinion, DC treats the talent a lot better than Marvel does. You, you get foreign royalties. They're better with royalty checks. This may have changed because I haven't worked with DC in a, or Marvel in a while. But there's, you know, there's there's like a half dozen, a dozen things you got to factor into every project, and you you know you want you want more goods than bad. Like no company is perfect. Um, you know, no gig is perfect, but you want more good things than bad things uh, to make a pleasurable gig. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you are well in your way, my friend, and you are working with some incredible people. And like you said, we cannot be more excited for Titans and all the other things that you have coming at us. And we just cannot thank you enough for your time well, today. And let, let me mention two things. Us. Yes, please. In, in addition to Titans, I'm writing The Scorched, which is the Spawn team book. Um, and I, I think I've written my 12th issue. So I've, I've done a solid year on that, which again, Never thought I'd be writing Spawn. And That's then I'm so writing awesome. a, um, it's called Spawn Kills Every Spawn. And it's one of these like goofy, oh. I'm going to kill oh. everybody, you know, that comedy books. Great. And it's this new, new artist. Well, not new to him, but new to the comic book world. Uh, Rob Sketchcraft Dunas. And he's got this really high energy kind of Scotty Young meets Jonan Vasquez kind of like. Oh, wow. Everything but the kitchen sink, like just super detailed, crazy art. And that's coming out. So um, between those three books, you know, I'm not a guy who wants to write eight superhero books and I can't write eight superhero books. So writing, you know, writing a book for Spawn, a mini for Spawn and a book for DC is is kind of my sweet spot right now. And that's beautiful. And that leads perfectly into the next question I was going to ask. I was going to throw it off to you and ask, you know, let the people know what's coming, what's coming now, what you got going on. So we have Spawn, we got Titans, Absolute Task Force uh, just came out. Is there anything else that I'm sure that there's some stuff that you can't talk about? But no, no, that, anything that's you can talk about. No, I, I eased up. I, I, it's, it's not the best market for, um, for creator owned right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of enjoying playing with other people's toys. Like I did a, I did a book for image and uh, coming out of COVID. I don't think it was, I was trying to write kind of a happy book and it needed more of an edge and it didn't really do well. And it's like, you know what? I'm going to not focus on creator own for a while and just, you know, just play with spawn and DC characters and kind of, you know, cause it's a different um, you're using a different part of your brain for creator owned. I mean, Again, you're playing God, whereas, you know, when you work for a company, you're a you're a caretaker for their, you know, you can't you can't make Batman kill a busload of nuns, but you can create your own character and do that. And it's like you don't want to. You, you, you the, the key is you got to respect the audience and be be uh, true to the characters. So I, I just want to. I just want to play with toys right now that aren't necessarily my own. I bet that can also be like a creative kind of breath of fresh air as well like you said you sure. know, being able to play in someone else's sandbox as opposed to building the sandbox yourself well the other thing is you know when you do create your own you gotta like you gotta do all this business shit you gotta worry about money and printing and payments and numbers and it's like we're well, working for dc you know i'm not worried about whether the book's gonna sell you know i you know you want to tell the good stories and all that but it's uh it's it's you don't have to worry about the business stuff you can just have fun with the characters and again you don't have you don't have the free reign that you would do with your own characters but if if you like the characters you're going to want to be true to them anyways you know you you don't want them killing a, a busload of nuns so you know it's the people who come in and think they're going to totally revamp a, an existing character unless you're grant morrison or scott snyder you're not gonna yeah just just one one last question from me before we do wrap up and that is like it's a lot of what you just spoke about now, like creator own and 
um, you have to use a different part of your brain. So what advice would you give to kids or even adults who want to get into comic creation? Oh boy. Well, in, in some ways it's easier. Like for me, they didn't have the internet, you know, they didn't have uh Kubert school, you know, they, they didn't have Twitter or Facebook where you could actually, or podcasts where you can actually like interact with creators. And it's, it's much easier to sort of like find creators and, and get advice, but there's more people trying now because it's, you know, that it's, uh, it, it's harder. Um, this, this sounds stupid. And this is the answer that everyone gives, but make comics, you know, find, find a collaborator, you know, even if you're doing a web comic or you're, you know, doing, you know, making something self-published at Kinko's when, when I'm at a con, you get this a lot. Someone comes up to me, they've got a great idea and they're like, Oh, you know, I've got this, this great idea in my head for a superhero story doesn't matter like an idea is nothing unless you make it happen like that that's the thing that people like doesn't doesn't matter if you have a billion ideas if you don't put it on paper if you don't even um ron mars has said this your first comic is gonna suck and your second comic's gonna suck a little less and then you know you make enough they're gonna stop sucking and you're gonna start making good comics so make that shitty comic and then make the next one better. Uh, and that, you know, that, that gets you there. And, but, but the key is make it, make it happen. I love that so much. Everyone listening and watching, go make that shitty comic, go out there, <laughs> make that comic, get your journey, journey started. And John, my man, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and nerding out with us today. It is. Yeah. Been sorry. I made you uh, work for it a little bit. Oh, it's made, hey, that's what we're here for. Bit. Hey, we all got to work sometimes, right? And if that means that we got to wait to talk to someone as awesome as you, then that is absolutely my pleasure. Like I said, well, it's been so fun having you. I hope that we can have you on later so we can get more into Titans when that is fully sure. kind of going and announced. You got and, my email. Uh, yeah, I'm oh. happy to do these things. You just got to we just got to make the schedule work. AF, I got a mission for you. Get me to Joburg or get me back to Cape Town. I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> hey, do you AF, know uh, do you know work. Carl Mostert AF? Uh, yes, the um, yeah, he's he, he's normally at the cons over here. He draws Spawn as well, Batman. So yeah, yeah, he we did uh, we did the gorilla special. He's a, he's a South African artist, and uh, yeah, we worked we worked on a few things together. Um, and yeah, I saw him in Cape Town. I'm just I know uh, yeah, I, I I know I know it's a smaller scene there. Uh, but yeah. the, the South African comic scene is pretty good. Pretty it's, robust. It's growing. It's growing every year. It's just getting bigger and bigger. And I love it. <laughs> I, I went to um, uh, South Africa Comic Con seven years ago. And then I went this year and it had grown. So it, would, it was so much bigger. John, me and you got to hop on a flight and go out to South Africa for the next con so we can hey, do I'm this. There, man. You're, you're going to love it. <laughs> I'll be waiting. goes a long way. The food's real good. Oh, I can't wait. I'm on the next flight out there. I've been meaning to see my brother AF. But again, John, we can't thank you enough for having you on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Everyone listening and watching this, be sure to go out and grab a ta Absolute Power Task Force 7 Issue 2 and keep a lookout for Titans. We will be keeping everyone updated on that. So check the description of this video to make sure that you're up to date when that comes out. I hope you all have a fantastic week and make sure to go and like and subscribe to all of Agents of Fan them on all of our socials tiktok twitter instagram wherever you get nerd news you can find us there thank you all for watching and we will see you guys all next time